Hi, everyone. OK, good. All right, uh, two anthropologists walk into a bar. No, actually, two anthropologists walk into an island. I forgot. So two anthropologists walk into an island, and they decide that they're going to study different sides of the island, and then in about six months, come back together and compare notes. So they go off, and they come back, and they meet in the center of the island. And the first anthropologist says, this is so exciting. I learned the most amazing thing. I pointed at a rock, and I said, what is that called? And the islander said, unga bunga. And then I pointed at a mountain, and I said, what is that? And the islander said, unga bunga. This is amazing. This has deep cultural implications for their thoughts of perspective and time and space and size. This is just incredible. I've unearthed something amazing. And the second anthropologist said, that's very interesting. Yes, on my side of the island, unga bunga means pointing your finger. So a little lesson in uh, not getting too carried away with yourself, sort of basing yourself in reality when you are trying to learn from people. So we're going to talk today about learning from your users. Um, everyone here is in some way involved with building things, right? Creating and making things. And you work really hard at that, right? Most of you have figured out ways to basically make things work, right? Users can use them. But your users don't always appreciate what you build. And that's frustrating, right? I mean, why don't they realize how hard you're working? Why don't they get it, right? How many people have users that just don't get it? No one wants to raise a hand. Couple raise your hand. Good for you. <laughs> right? They're not getting it. But the problem is, did you try and get them first? Right? You don't know the insights to their lives. You don't know the little details to what they're really trying to do. So while you can make something usable and functional, something that people can use to get things done, what you really want to do is make something that people love to interact with. And I want to give you a few pointers on how to do that today. So first, let's consider this. A little bit of a lack of understanding there on both of those levels, right? So what do we do about that? Well, first of all, my name is Kelly Moran. I am a design researcher at Project 202, and I'm also an anthropologist. Uh, has anyone here ever been able to work with a researcher before? Has anyone observed research happening before? Has anyone ever met an anthropologist before? All right, all right, not very many, and I think half of you I know. Great. So who am I? Where do my people come from? Where, what island am I from? Well, traditionally we come from a university, and I do have the fancy book learning behind me. I've also done some work out in the wild. I served in the US Peace Corps in Uzbekistan for 27 months, and I did a study abroad in Saudi Arabia. That bottom circle there, um, I always forget to point out what that is. Those are people, one of those is me, I'm the tall one. Uh, and we're wearing the traditional women's garments in Saudi Arabia. Um, the hat is not traditional, but someone gave it to me and I thought I should wear it. So not a traditional part of the Saudi women's wear. Uh, after all of that, I uh, found a couple of jobs, worked with some companies, eventually ended up at Project 202. At Project 202, we like to uncover user needs. Ooh, that totally got lost. Uncover user needs, design great solutions, and build solutions out to launch. And at Project 202, I think we have a really unique situation because what we do is we have researchers, designers, and developers, and each one of those is allowed to evolve and build their practice, and we draw on the strengths of all of those. To do that really well, though, we have to understand one another. We have to break down some of the, some of the silos, some of the gaps we have between us. So to do that here today, let's you and I get a few things out on the table. Let's talk about stereotypes and preconceived notions. OK, so who am I? I'm an anthropologist. What is that like? Am I studying you right now? No. All right? Do you do your job all the time? No. Um, I'm not interested in, in studying individuals on the sly, sneakily. I do it for work. I study groups of people. I like to see how they do things with their consent. Um, another one, I watch the show Bones. You must like dead people. Um, I do that. This one's fun. Uh, you must wear a lot of turquoise jewelry, sing kumbaya, and do drum circles. I seriously get this. That's hippies. It's fine. It's not mutually exclusive. 
but not necessarily anthropologists. Okay, your turn. You're not very good with people, you don't really like people, and you avoid people at all costs. And yet here you all are at this conference in this big room together. This is a really unhealthy way to think of the people that you work with. This is a terrible thing to think about people. Um, you totally want to build an app for me. I have this really good idea. It's going to be a startup. You're going to just like build it for free because then you'll get like some of the profits or whatever. Um, and you would love to do that for me, right? Because I'm studying you right now because I never stop doing my job and you never stop doing your job and you would do it for free. Um, this one is um, really prevalent. Um, you make stuff, like you make stuff that's that from nothing. I don't understand how that's not creative, but I hear this a lot. I hear this from developers. Um, I did a poll in my office, what are the top three stereotypes that you get, and this one came back from everyone. So, um, not cool. I don't know what like a creative is. They say like, oh, the developers aren't part of the creatives. Like, like do they go in packs? What are creatives? What do they do? I don't know. Um, so, now that we have that on the table, and we know that those things are sort of silly. Through our powers combined, we can start to understand the users better now that we're understanding one another a little better. There is another piece to this puzzle, right? Users don't know what they want, don't appreciate us, and they're just doing it wrong. How do we defeat these stereotypes? What do we do? Well, according to Project 202, we do design research. We direct the strategy and design for software projects. We understand our users. Uh, my favorite is Margaret Mead. I'm sorry, the yellow's not showing. What it says is that anthropology demands the open-mindedness with which one must look and listen, record an astonishment, and wonder that which one would not have been able to guess. Not have been able to guess, right? Don't use those stereotypes. Don't rely on those. You want to actually observe people, talk to them. Don't guess, right? Figure out what your users are doing by involving them. I have another example of some islanders. These are, uh, these are two villagers, um, and the different groups on the different sides of the island wear different color lenses. One group is the blue lens tribe, and they run around seeing everything is blue. The other group of villagers is the yellow lenses, and they run around and say everything is yellow. And they don't exactly see eye to eye because they're seeing these different colors all the time. So one of the villagers decides that She's going to go over to the yellow side and put on a pair of yellow lenses, and she's going to spend some time with them. This is a great idea. It's a great start. So she goes and she spends some time with the yellow lenses on, and then she comes back to her blue lens people, and they say, what did you learn? And she said, it was so amazing because everything was green. Right. So part of understanding other people is understanding that everyone has their own unique lenses. Everybody has a different perspective and a different view on which they look at the world. And so part of understanding what your users are going to need is to try and step into that, to understand that you have your lens and they have theirs, and figure out where those differences are. So what is ethnography anyways, right? That's a, that's a word that's been going around. It's been used in business lately. Um, you see it all over the place. I see it all over the place. Um, who has heard about ethnography before? Not many, right? Who's like read it in like Harvest Business Review or seen it like come up on some big fancy business page, something like that, yeah? A couple? Yeah. So, so what is it, right? There's a lot of misconception about what ethnography is. Well, first of all, ethnography is a descriptive study of peoples and cultures. That's the basic definition. You'll hear all kinds of definitions for what it is, but this is what it is, a descriptive study of people and cultures. Ethnographic research, importantly, is an approach, not a method. It's not a specific, exact, prescriptive way of doing things. It's a way of approaching a problem. It's a philosophy. It's a way of looking at things. As such, it favors qualitative methods over quantitative, so uh, describing things instead of counting them. And a famous anthrop anthropologist, Clifford Geertz, has said that ethnography should seek thick description. So thick description, meaning providing context, providing information that your audience wouldn't have if you don't provide it to them. Right, so his classic example is a wink. If you describe a wink without using thick description, if you describe it thinly, a wink is the closing and opening of an eye, right? Very straightforward. But 
people can do that for a lot of different reasons. You might wink because you're flirting, or because you're letting someone in on a joke, or you might just have something stuck in your contact lens. So if you are describing a situation and you say, Jenny winked at Joe, and you don't provide any thick description, you're irresponsibly allowing your audience to interpret that however they need to. And you might get some pretty bad rumors about Jenny and Joe going on when she just had dust in her eye. Right, so you need to provide a thick description. What was happening before the wink and after the wink? Who else saw it? How did they respond? What is Jenny and Doe's relationship? So when you're studying your users, you need to understand a little bit more about what they're doing and how they're using things in that wider environment around it. Ethnographic research is also conducted in context where things happen. Um, lab studies are a great way to learn things in a controlled environment. They're for a specific purpose. They're not ethnography. They're just a different thing. We say that if you want to understand the pen, you must understand the paper, right? If you were building, the perf building a pen and you didn't think about what kind of paper it was going to be used on, you're not going to be providing a very good solution to that. Ethnographic research is also systematic but responsive. So this is sort of tackling two myths that I hear about ethnography. One is that ethnography is just kind of like hanging out with people. It's a little bit more systematic and orderly than that. You have guidelines, you have things you want to find. When you go out to study your users, you have an end point in mind, you have some thoughts about what's going on. But it's responsive to emerging trends and themes, right? So what that means is you might have to change, you might have to be a little bit uh, flexible in your approach. When you're going out and you're working with users, you might find they're doing something completely unexpected. And if you just try and go on with the questions you've written down to ask them, you'll find that you're completely off base. So you need to be responsive to what's going on. Ethnographic research also uses key informants who act as guides and help provide access to the community. So that's often things like stakeholders or subject matter experts when we apply it to software. So these are people who can give you those good reality checks, right? Unga bunga does not mean rock, right? You have someone who can help you tease that apart. Ethnographic research, most importantly, seeks out the insider perspective. In anthropology, we call it the emic perspective. Uh, it seeks to see how the users themselves are viewing something. And then it layers in your outsider perspective, your edict. I know those are super similar. Anthropology students mess these up all the time in undergrad. Um, I think of emic, like me, the M, you're looking at my perspective. So here's a really good example of that not in use. Superman, right? So Lois Lane says, what's the S stand for? Superman says, it's not an S. In my world, it means hope. Lois Lane being a little bit snarky, well, here it's an S. Right, not really considering the emic perspective. She's a journalist, not an ethnographer. She has a different approach, and it's funnier this way. Ethnographic research is also generative. So you're doing it to discover new things. If you go out there thinking you already know exactly what your users are doing, you're doing that wrong. Sherlock Holmes via Arthur Conan Doyle, Never theorize before you have data. Invariably, you end up twisting facts to suit theories instead of theories to suit facts. Ethnographic research also looks to find that implicit or that not typically stated feature of a group. What this means is that a survey is not going to work, right? It's not the things that people will just blatantly tell you. It's those sort of deeper, more secretive things. Uh, I have an example here. Oops, sorry. Uh, so let's pretend that aliens come down, right? And they ask you some questions about how your day goes and, and what you do in your life. So what kinds of things might you tell the aliens that you do? Get dressed, take a shower. I hope you take a shower before you get dressed, but if you don't tell them that, right? You might eat, right? Most people don't answer that they breathe, but they do that all day long. So when the aliens take you back, and they've created a habitat for you, and they didn't include air, and then they say, well, the user didn't tell me that. Whose fault is that really? Right, so what is that implicit thing, right? What is that thing that you only find by observing and watching, right? We call that making the familiar strange and the strange familiar. It's just sort of twisting your perspective, right? What color is my lens? What color is their lens, right? What happens when you combine those? This is another really good example from the anthropologist Horace Minor. Uh, there is, was a group called the Nasarema, 
And the Nasarema were an interesting tribe. They had some very sort of complex rituals um, surrounding um, what they kind of thought of as mouth devils or mouth demons. And they had a lot of sort of processes that they would involve to, to handle those and to eliminate those. And they would, they would visit these like holy mouth men all the time. Very strange. But if you flip the word, it's brushing your teeth and going to the dentist, right? Everything can be strange if you're not understanding it, right? So for that reason, ethnographic research is inclusive. There's a participatory component. You want to involve your users, right? Let them know what you're doing, why you're doing it. Let them explain to you what they're doing. Come back to them, say, I think when you did this, this will help. What do you think about that? Oh, no, 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 let's try it this way, right? You want to include them. So when we apply this to, a, uh, to software, a lot of times it's called design ethnography. And clearly, uh, doing a large ethnographic study to build software is expensive and time consuming. So there are a uh, couple of things you can do to make that easier and more feasible. Uh, one of these is, um, looking at design ethnography as that way to reduce the probability of failure by understanding what's going on with your users. All right, Harvest Business Review, they talk about ethnography sometimes. Why most product launches fail. We didn't do the research, but we're pretty sure this will work. Uh, also, when you're doing ethnography or learning from your users, you don't have to call it ethnography, you can just call it learning. Um, you want to avoid that reliance on self-reported data, right, those surveys. I have an example here. Uh, we did a project where um, this was when the term green and eco-friendly was still really new, and um, this client wanted to understand how to reach those green consumers, and they, they thought, well, what does green even mean? What's that, what's that mean to be a green person? What is that? So we handed out disposable cameras, because people were still using those back then for more than just weddings. And um, we gave them the cameras for a week, said take pictures around your home of things that are green. Uh, we collected those, developed the photos, brought them back to them. A lot of what we saw were these seventh generation brand cleaners. Is anyone familiar with these? Okay. The idea behind them is um, that allegedly they're based on a Native American belief that every action you take should impact, you should consider the implications for the next seven generations, right? So thinking far ahead for what you do, right? And so we asked people, we said, we said, do you use these for, for all of your cleaning needs or do you use a variety of products? And they said, oh God, no, I have children. I don't use chemicals in my home. I only use these safe, non-toxic, chemical-free products. Right, that's all that I'd use. So, seeking to understand a little bit deeper, we said, can you kind of show us how you use these? Um, maybe demonstrate for us. And so they took us to the kitchen cabinet and opened it up and right next to their seventh generation eco-friendly, chemical-free, non-toxic cleansers. So we said, oh, what is the bleach for? And they said, oh, I only use that for the really tough jobs. They weren't lying. They were telling us about their aspirational selves, right? They wanted to be using just those eco-friendly cleaners, but they weren't quite getting the job done, so they were doing other things. If you had just taken them on their word and tried to build a product for them, you might find that they lack confidence in that product because from their experience, green things don't quite work for everything, right? So we need to understand those things. And finally, when you're learning from your users, you really want to think qualitatively about what you're doing, so descriptively understanding, uh, seeing the context, and understanding their problems from their point of view, their emic perspective. What is it they're trying to do? And then you apply your viewpoint on top of that. So let's look at an example of integrating this. So what we like to do is we send a researcher and a designer together out into the field. I would love to start bringing developers out as well. Um, I think that's a great way to, to make sure that they're, that y'all are exactly seeing what's happening. Right now, that's not quite feasible. Um, we do bring them into the lab to observe, and we've gotten good feedback from that. But we send the designer and the researcher out, and then they switch roles, and the designer begins to design, and the researcher sort of consults on that. And then we loop in the developers, and the researcher comes back in to do testing. 
So researcher gets to follow along a little bit throughout the way. I would love it if the developer got to kind of start from the beginning as well. And in this way, you have that user-focused innovation right from the start of the project. I have some examples I want to go through with you. Uh, we did some work on some enterprise software um, for accountants, so professional accountants doing account reconciliations. Um, this was a large piece of software. Um, customers were saying that there were too many clicks and it's hard to use. Most importantly for the client, the sales were lagging. Um, but they said, you know, this software needs to be customizable, right? Who's ever not said that? Who's never said it needs to be like flexible? Um, and it needs to fit within a suite of other enterprise products. For this, this was a large project. Um, it was a big product, so we needed to talk to more people. And we talked to 19 users at six sites. I think we were in four different states, so a large project, so not all like that. And, from, and then we talked to three people inside the organization. So from the total user count, we had 800 unique insights and observations. Let's look at a couple of them. In context observation. Uh, the first thing that will happen when you try and do this, um, we have everything ready for you in a conference room. Please just go off into this corner. We will bring people into you. Just stay here. Right? You want to mitigate that. Um, let's just see where they're sitting. Can we just look at their workstation? Can we take a couple pictures? Oh, look, let me pull up a chair. Right? Um, be a little bit creative. Get into that environment. Don't let them push you off into the conference room. Let's see why. Why not the conference room? What are some things that you see of this user in context? Two monitors and a calculator. Yeah, still using a calculator. Two monitors. What else? This is the first time no one's pointed out the banana. Good for you all. Thank you. Other people. There is other people involved in this. Files, papers, sticky notes. It's got a ruler. At some point, he's going to be doing something with that, right? This is just what we're seeing from being in the environment. We saw that five out of six of them were using two monitors. They were still using adding machines. Um, they were in a cube or an open space, so lots of stuff happening around them. Paper, paper, paper. And this, so sad, um, the system had the ability to look up reference numbers, but the way the results returned, it was like pages and pages and pages of 10 at a time, not really able to filter, so you just had to click through. And so a user who had a broken ankle would rather get up from her desk, hobble down the hallway to a locked room, open it up, get the correct binder, come out of the room, relock the door because it was supposed to be secure at all times, hobble back down to her desk, look through the desk, flip through the pages, find the number she wants, write it down, close the book, Hobble back over to the door, unlock it, put the book in, take the book out. I mean, this is ridiculous. She would rather do that than use the system. It was literally at her fingertips, but she couldn't find it, right? Serious problem um, with this filtering and sorting. And that's just what we learned just from going and being in the environment and watching people. So what are some things that we learned when we actually sat down with them, observed, and asked a couple of questions? So we learned that they really can't break away mentally from Excel. It's the most amazing software ever. Um, interesting thing, um, they were importing data of multiple types into Excel as images because they, they just love Excel. So they would take PDFs and put those into an Excel spreadsheet. They would take screenshots. They were using um, Snippet and taking screenshots of things and putting those into Excel. And then they would use the Excel features to um, highlight and also circle the same piece of relevant data. And we said, why are you doing that? And they said, well, it's better than my manager not seeing it and rejecting this. Because you ruin their numbers for the whole month if their manager kicks something back. So they were just making this atrocious, like, if they knew how to like, make things flash, they would have put that on there too. Um, attachments and cover sheets. Uh, so inside the software, they needed to attach supporting documents. And the software allowed you to attach almost a limited, limitless number of attachments. But it took so long for the managers to open each one, because there was such a problem with navigating to each attachment and opening and viewing it, that they just wanted one attachment. So that's also why they were doing that Excel sheet with like PDFs inside it, so that you could just, the manager could just click once and open the Excel sheet, and then go through the tabs of the Excel sheet. They would rather do that than have things organized inside the software. Um, 
this is really sad, they were printing out documents for multiple PDFs so that they could physically organize the papers and then rescan them in into the order that they wanted them because they didn't know how to reorganize inside a PDF. And they were making these cover sheets in Excel so that in that single attachment of Excel, the very first tab, they would title cover sheet and they would summarize all the account data uh, and activity for the month and put that on the cover sheet. That is exactly what the software is for. Exactly what the software was for. And they are putting it into Excel and attaching it inside the software and pretty much just using that as a holding station. A really expensive file cabinet. We also saw that their roles weren't matching up very well. The software, you could log in as, uh, as basically a doer, a reconciler, or as a reviewer, or as an administrator. But many companies were doubling up their doers with their administrators. And so the assumed workflow is that you'd log in as your doer, and you would start, and then you would go, and then you would be done. But really what happened is that you would log in as your doer and you would start and then someone would say, oh my God, I need you to stop right now. I have to have you add me as a new account manager on this thing. I have to do it now. So they'd have to stop, log out, log back in as the administrator, do that work, go back in. And the system didn't really allow for those switching of the roles. A lot of switching gear. And then they were sort of sad. They'd gone to school to be accountants and they were spending all this time trying to make the software work properly for them. And then we saw, right, all that work was actually being done in Excel and spreadsheets and email communications back and forth, and then they were just using the system to hold it all. So we did several things, um, which we can probably sort of skip over for large part. One was bringing in Excel patterns, of course. Bringing in, here's the, my favorite one in the center. Um, the software had something called an account homepage that was something that the, the people who developed the software had created. Um, and it was basically the cover sheet. So we renamed it the cover sheet, right? Don't make them use your words. They have their own words. They're professional accountants. Users are pros at what they do. If they have words for something, work that in. Uh, cleaned up, of course, the viewing of attachments and loading of attachments so that they weren't making these these horribly ugly, terrible Excel sheets with, you know, six or seven tabs with the PDFs attached inside them and the lights and the circles and the highlights, right? Make that just easier to get in there. And then we transitioned to design and qualified people did things. And then you go into testing. I just want to have a couple of notes on testing. Um, people sometimes get frightened of it. But it can be very low-key, very scrappy. It depends on what you're trying to do. Um, I don't want people to be afraid of it. I don't want you to be afraid to put your software in front of a user and just say, try some things out, right, and just watch them. You will learn a ton just by watching them do what they do. So how can you bring ethnography to your projects? How can you learn about your users? So I have a question for you. Do you need a researcher to go with you to talk to users? No, don't be stereotype number one. You're not afraid of people. Go talk to them, right? Um, if you're gonna go talk to 22 people across four states, you might wanna have a researcher involved. This is where we come in handy. But, but get started, right? Put your boots on and get out there. Talk to two people next week. A couple weeks later, talk to two more. I'm going to offer you Skype as an alternative if you have that multi-state scope, right? Um, otherwise, if they're around you, you should go to them. Um, and what's not showing up is um, don't go in with solutions in mind, right? If you're still building, um, make sure you're figuring out what the problems are first with the users before you go in with solutions. Brief pause here to talk about informed consent. Um, it's very important that people know when you're studying them. That's why I'm not studying you right now. That was my stereotype number one. Um, if you're doing something low key, like just um, meeting someone at their office and asking them some questions, showing them a few things, you can make this very casual. You can say, by the way, I'm gonna take some of this information back and work on it with my team. Is that okay with you? 
that's good. That's informed consent. You've let them know what you're doing, and you've given them a chance to say, um, that's creepy and weird, no. And they really rarely say that, but you have to give them that chance. If you are taking photographs, video, audio, you must tell them before you turn those devices on, and you would probably want to go ahead and get written consent for that to make sure that everything is above the board if anyone asks any questions later. Um, and so you need to get a written form if you're going to take that kind of stuff away, audio, images, things like that. Some tips on observing. Um, remember the physical environment. That's why you're going in context. You want to see what's around them. Are they using two monitors? Are they still using a calculator? You want to see the lighting and the noise. This will help you decide if the UI should be dark or light, um, if there's a lot of distractions, if they're going to need help focusing. If there are other people involved that they're talking to, what are those roles? What is that workflow? What artifacts are around? Are they still using paper and binders? Can you help bring that into the system, or do they need that still? And then documenting it, right? Ethnography is a descriptive discipline. You want to write things down. Take the photographs and the audio if you have permission. Some tips on questions. You are not an expert in other people's lives. Even if you're building an app for developers, you are only an expert in how you develop. You don't know how they do things. So go in with that open mind of, I want to learn from you. A really good tip is to rephrase the things that they say and ask them if you got it right. People love to hear their words brought back to them. When you're having a conversation with a friend, pay attention next time. You're probably not listening to like 70% of what they say because you're crafting your own response and you're trying to remember that you want to tell them about the movie that you saw or the podcast that you listen to. You're not listening that well. This is very natural. You want to prove that you are listening. So repeat some things that they say. So if I heard you right, I think what you said was, and then let them correct you if they need to. Sometimes people kind of want like a second chance. They want to kind of go back a little bit. That's fine. Avoid the leading questions. So things like, this page isn't really working for you, is it? Right, don't lead them, right? Say things like, tell me what's good on this page and what's not so good on this page, right? Ask them to describe for you, right? And then finally, take note of their ideas and ask what problem does this solve, right? We hear a lot, um, my users have really bad ideas. My users don't understand how things are working on the back end, so they're trying to do this really stupid thing. All right. Well, they're not experts in building stuff. I like to use Homer Simpson for this. Does everyone remember the episode where Homer got to design his own car? Right, so Homer got to design his own car, and it looked atrocious, and the whole company failed, and his secret brother was involved, and it was terrible. Um, Homer's not an expert at car design. Homer had problems and he solved them the best way he could. If the designers and the engineers had instead asked him, what are you trying to solve? What's bothering you with the way the car is today? They could have provided expert opinions. So by getting his emic internal perspective, they could apply their edic outsider expertise and provided a proper solution to Homer's car problem. Don't expect your users to do your job for you. And finally, when you're learning from your users, honor the idea of reciprocity. They're giving you something, give them something back. Starbucks gift card, something like that. Let them know that you are really appreciative and that, you've helped, that they have helped you. I have a quick recommended reading list for you. Um, I am a firm believer that if you're going to do anything that you're going to remotely call ethnography or qualitative research, you should have read a little bit of that before. So as I said, ethnography is both a, a process and it's also a written product. So I have a couple ethnographies for you and um, they're kind of fun. This one, Guest of the Sheik. Um, this woman, um, this was back in the 50s. She married an anthropologist and for their honeymoon, he took her to Iraq. So he wanted to get his thesis work done. And so they went off, and he very quickly realized that 50% of the population was entirely inaccessible to him because he was not allowed to talk to any of the women. So he said, could you do a little research for me? So she went out into the, into the village, and um, she did work for him and helped him out. And she was really inspired by that. And when they came back, she, came, she went back to school and got her PhD as an anthropologist. And her story is just, just really nice. Um, it's a really interesting read, I think. Uh, this next one super fun, Gang Leader for a Day. This was featured in Freakonomics. Um, 
so this is a sociologist who originally was going out and doing survey uh, data, and he wanted to study the economics of gangs. And he went to one of the worst areas of Chicago with his clipboard, and he went up to a man and said, what is it like to be black in America? Didn't go well. They took him to a stairwell in a practically abandoned building and held him there, didn't hurt him, but held him there for hours until their legitimate gang leader arrived and said, what do we do with this guy? Uh, and he said, if you want to know what it's like to be black in America, come back tomorrow. And to his surprise, Sudhir went back and he ended up studying this gang for about a decade and doing some really interesting work on how how economics works inside gangs in the United States. So really fun read. This one is the, the heaviest of them all, both in content and in style. Saints, Scholars, and Schizophrenics, Mental Illness in Rural Ireland. It's a heavy read, but for those of you who wanted something a bit beefier, I want to recommend that. The final thing I want to leave you with is this quote from another ethnographer, Bronislaw Malinowski. Ethnography has a goal. An ethnographer should never lose sight of this. The goal is briefly to grasp the user's point of view, his relation to life, and his vision of his world. Thank you so much. <laughs>